Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ozark Radio Hour, soon to be Oleo Radio of the Ozarks, brought to you by the Inside Straight and Thanatopsis Club. I am Richard Pillay. And I'm still Kent Crow. And we're your hosts today for about an hour of purely organic radio. Still, always fresh, always local, and always honest. And I'm Jeremiah Alvarado, refusing to be locked inside the producer's box where my predecessor, Dan Croats, has spent way too much of his lifetime in. (laughs) You know, kid, keep running that mouth of yours and we can still lock you up in there. (laughs) Richard, I'm just making sure that you and Kent are as comfortable as you can possibly get during this directed but world-shattering transition. (laughs) Kent, do you notice how highly our producer thinks of himself? Uh, Don't worry, Richard. Uh, There's plenty of time to bring him crash down like a little Icarus. Icarus? <laughs> Icarus. 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 You know, I, I, yeah. I always, I always want to not use the correct right. pronunciation. I mean, you know, you fly too close to the sun, you know, you're going to get burned. Yeah, and, and you know what? You and I radiate so much glory. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you're starting to be a little bit nauseating. I think we could melt any young man's feathers. <laughs> oh, Kent, unlike Icarus, I know not to fly too close oh. to the sun. And I'm sure that is what he said, too. Uh, well, we shouldn't belittle our, our new producer, you know, just for fear of chasing him away. Richard, what do we have on the show today? I'm glad you asked that, Kent. This week we're going through the first issue of the Arkansas November Ballot and give our fresh, local, and honest opinion on the issues. And Sharon Aboard continues her exploration of authors that have added to the culture of the Ozarks that we know and love in Welcome to the Conversation. This week she talks about Ellen Gilchrist, her literary career and book, The Annunciation, which is set in Fayetteville, Eureka Springs, and the Buffalo River. Mm, And Tracy Johnson returns with Music is Medicine for the Soul. You know, Kent, we don't really need the kid here, I don't think. That is what you think, Richard. (laughs) You know, judging from what we've done so far, I think Richard's right. Perhaps, but perhaps not. Do you even know what we will be discussing on Oleo Radio today? Yes, I do. In fact... (laughs) I've read the script, and I can prove it. <laughs> All right. This, this week on Oleo Radio, we'll begin by going through one or more or a few of the ballot issues that are coming up on the Arkansas November ballot. Hey, Kent. What do you, you think the kid realizes that it said earlier? I don't, don't tell him. We'll let the uh, listeners rip him apart for it. Uh, okay. Well, shoot, I think I do need to spend some time in the producer's box. I see why Dan <laughs> has sat himself in there for so long. Well, before you go placing yourself inside a box, how about we go ahead and learn about what is on the ballot this year? Well, yeah. uh, would you like to do the honors, Jeremiah? Why, thank you, Kent. The first you issue on... are getting so syrupy. <laughs> God, I'm... Well, you know, it's, 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 it's a new level of professionalism I'm... and etiquette and, and, and courtesy. and Those are things I've never seen from you before, Kent. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to butter up the kid. I, mean, I can you know, tell. You know, I haven't yeah. submitted my, my first new uh, Things Your Mother Didn't Tell You script, uh, and all right. I'm, I'm afraid I won't make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the first issue on the Arkansas November ballot deals with the lengthening of term years for county officials, which includes, and can't correct me if I forget one, county judge, county surveyor, circuit clerk, and I believe sheriff, assessor, coroner, and treasurer. And they'll have their terms lengthened from two years to four-year terms after the 2018 election. Well, actually, that's that's all correct. However, you know, we have not had a county surveyor in decades. I'm I'm not even sure the the statutory provision still provides for the election of a county surveyor. But here's what's going on with this. I think think that, you know, it's an interesting issue. It's an amendment to the state constitution, which means that if it passes, it can only be changed again by a vote of uh, of the citizens of the state. The legislature can't tinker with it. One of the real problems with with the provision that we have under the Constitution right now is that by limiting local officials to a two-year term, they are hardly in office and getting their feet on the ground before they have to start running for re-election again. And just simply the costs of running for re-election, when you consider the salary that they're actually paid, is a real burden on a lot of people. And frankly, a two-year term probably keeps 
a lot of qualified people from making the decision to run for the offices. Uh, and so uh, as a result, you know, we might say you get what you pay for. So I think uh, I'm in support of this, uh, this particular measure. I think that lengthening the terms to a four-year stint uh, will give people actually enough time to get in office, enact some, uh, you know, changes, and uh, perhaps make some improvements, and, and we may generate a better quality candidate as a result. Well, uh, so as opposed to uh, congressional term limits, which we many people want to limit, Mm-hmm. You think the offices that are more administrative uh, that are more in the street, these, these county clerk and, mm-hmm. and things should be extended. Well, I, I, I think they should, and quite, quite frankly, I've term limited. Yeah, I, w- I would like to see party designations done away with down at the local level. In, in addition, I don't think that will happen, but especially in light of some other constitutional provisions, but you know, in reality, what does it matter if if your county clerk is a Democrat or a Republican? Well, it's, it should be an apolitical situation. Well, we've, we've done that yeah. with judges. We've taken away political designations for judges because we want impartiality and we don't want the appearance of impropriety or political influence in the judiciary. And I, th- I think that's an important thing down on the county level. Okay, Ken, just uh, you know, there's much more issues, uh, but I just mm-hmm. want to ask. You know, some people would say that having only a two-year term gives a little more uh, liability to to the people who are being elected. What what would you say to that? Well, I, I would I would say that you know in a, in the span of a two-year period of time, uh, most newly elected f- officials for the first year are just learning their job. Um, you know, if you re-elect someone who's been in the job for 15 or 20 years, that's not exactly the case. They have their staff in place, and they continue to do things the way they've always done them. And I think that that, in fact, is an impediment to progress uh, down at the local level. I think that saying, well, if I can vote again in two years, I can hold the son of a gun accountable, and if I don't like what he's doing, well, I'll throw him out of office. Well, you know, it's pretty hard to judge the performance of an elected pro- official in terms of a 24-month period. I just don't think it gives someone an honest opportunity uh, to learn and do the job they're elected to do. Uh, I think that I have to agree with you for a change. Hey, progress. <laughs> A, a clerk's office, for instance, uh, the new technologies uh, that are desperately needed uh, just for record keeping and other things are very difficult to implement you know, mm-hmm. to find out what you have and then to implement changes. A short term limit, especially in that case, is, is certainly not a good thing. No, I agree. All right. Now, the, there's, a, I believe, a total of four parts to the first issue on the November ballot. And to continue along, it uh, this issue will also prevent elected county officials from holding civil office. Uh, mm-hmm. Would yeah. you explain that, Kent? Right. Uh, essentially, what this provides for is that if you're an elected official, uh, under the current law as, as it is established, you could be appointed to serve on various commissions. So taking it down to the, the basic local level, hypothetically, you could be the mayor of Eureka Springs and you could still be appointed to serve on the Parks Commission. That doesn't seem like something that we want to do. And, and so under the proposal uh, for this particular ballot measure, um, we would eliminate the appointment of, of elected officials to certain positions. Now, the courts have decided that certain uh, civil offices include things like being on the Board of Pardons, Uh, being a school director or on a school board, being a municipal judge, being a city attorney, or being on certain commissions down at the city level. And so if you're elected to a city office or to to hold a civil office, then that's what you do, and you can't wear two hats. So we're we're trying to, uh, I think, correct that. I think that's a good measure. Okay. The next part, uh, it would allow legislators to pass laws that say unopposed candidates can be elected without their name appearing on the ballot. Uh, that's Again, that's something that I agree with. And, and the reason that I agree with it is you're wasting a lot of money. 
if you're running unopposed and there's no doubt about the outcome of the election, right. why bother using up paper uh, printing and publishing ballots uh, that have a list of unopposed candidates. And we see it every year down on the local level. We see a whole slate of unopposed candidates. And you can vote for all the unopposed candidates or you can leave it blank. The outcome is the same. Uh, you know, so, you know, why do we continue to do things that essentially make no sense. Right. To that, I mean, what would you say, you know, because for me personally, mm -hmm. it's more of an issue of being able to see who is running. You know, mm -hmm. do you think that not having unopposed candidates on the ballot will ruin people's mm -hmm. ability to see who they have elected well, for no, office? No, we're not, we're, not, we're not talking about some sort of secrecy. Uh, what we're talking about is someone going through all the steps and procedures that they have to go through. They have to file petitions to, to get on the ballot. They have to uh, come up with enough signatures for their nomination, or they have to pay filing fees in order to get on their party's particular ballot. And typically, candidates are very happy to make announcements, uh, publish their positions in the newspapers, be interviewed by the press. All of those things make it very public with regard to who is running. It's just if you've done all of that and nobody has the wherewithal to step forward and say, I disagree and I want to run too, then, you know, we're talking about printing a ballot and, and marking something that doesn't need to be done. And I think it's uh, upon the voters' uh, responsibility uh, to have some citizenship and know who is taking care of your government at home. Uh, be involved. If you don't know who's handling your own city council or who's on the, you know, uh, what kind of a citizen is that? Uh, I, what kind I, of a voter is that? I know, and, and not many people know that, that you are running unopposed for the president of Northern Carroll County. And and I, <laughs> we, we don't want them to know. No, we don't. Yes. Now, I want you to weld the power with, you know, tyrannical authority and, you know. We should go ahead and okay. move on. Yeah, we probably should. Well, let's uh, you know, th this, uh, this particular issue on the ballot also uh, takes the wonderful step of trying to define infamous crimes. You are prohibited from running for public office in the state of Arkansas under the Constitution if you have been convicted of an infamous crime. However, nowhere in the Constitution does it define what that is. I was just going to ask you, infamous has several definitions. In, in this case, how is it applied? Well, in this, in this case, it, it really hasn't been applied other than through decisions of the court when someone was challenged. And so what the, uh, what the courts have come back and said, if you're convicted of a felony, that constitutes an infamous crime. What the new legislation is attempting to do, or the amendment to the Constitution, is to define infamous crime to include things like abusing your office, being convicted of abuse of office, or being abused of tampering, tampering being uh, interfering with the judicial process by trying to influence uh, witnesses in particular proceedings of misdemeanors that involve deceit or fraud of some sort. So by including these definitions of these crimes, we eliminate some uncertainty as to who and who is not eligible to run for office. So somebody guilty of uh, organizing gerrymandering and voter suppression would I bet that's not included so. no 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 it's no, a gerrymandering is you know that's still legal yeah, and yeah that's what I know, was afraid of. yeah they're yeah. gonna draw those uh, political division lines any way they want to okay so that I think pretty much covers that particular issue all right uh, Kent would you explain then to us what the second issue the is? the second issue on the on the uh, the ballot is a provision that would amend the Constitution to permit the governor of the state to retain his powers and authority when he's outside the boundaries of the state of Arkansas. Under the current Constitution, there are certain provisions under which the governor loses his authority. As an example, if he were to become uh, mentally incompetent, or if for health reasons he was no longer able to exercise the, the duties of his office, then the lieutenant governor would take over. One of the other provisions under the current constitutional provision is that if he leaves the state of Arkansas, the lieutenant governor assumes the power of the office. That creates some real problems, and it has in the past, because some lieutenant governors who may be from a uh, different political party than the governor or who disagree with the governor on a particular issue wait for him to leave the state, and then they sign orders permitting someone to do something that the governor absolutely opposed. So under this particular provision, uh, the governor would retain 
his powers when he was outside the state and the lieutenant governor wouldn't be able to take over. That doesn't eliminate the provisions with regard to his mental competence or his health or other certain issues, but only uh, when he was outside the state. That's, That's in, it's interesting. Uh, so this has happened before. Oh, it has. Okay, so if I may ask, how sure. is a lieutenant governor chosen? He's elected just like the governor and all the other state officials. Okay, so, so this just makes it so that essentially the, uh, the governor can still keep some power whenever he's away going off to... Well, as, as an example, Asa Hutchinson, our current governor, has already been out of the state uh, four times, uh, I want to say since he's taken office, uh, on economic trips. He's been to China. Uh, he's been to governor's conferences outside of the state for other, other business. And so... Uh, He's, you know, any governor is going to be called out of the state on a regular basis, and we just want to avoid these political disputes uh, arising from an occurrence when the governor is gone. Again, I support this measure. I think it's a reasonable one, and I think that's a power that we just shouldn't provide for. And again, you have to remember, the Arkansas Constitution was written in 1874. Well, and, I, okay? and to support that, you mm -hmm. know, with today's technology... The governor mm -hmm. isn't, he may, his body may be out mm -hmm. of the state, but he still has the capability to communicate and administrate uh, and govern from anywhere in the world. All the time. In 1874, if the governor had to go to Washington, you wouldn't see him for three months. Exactly. You needed a lieutenant governor to right. take over the state and reins of power. We don't need that anymore. Well, these things, I think, are encouraging. You know, we love Arkansas and we love li living in Arkansas. Arkansas is is last in some of the worst things in the world, <laughs> and maybe we're starting to fix some of those things. Well, you know, you say we. I, I, it's a good thing Dan's not in the in the control booth anymore. Well, that Minnesotan. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've only been down here about twenty years, so mm -hmm. I'll always be an outsider. Um, I know people that have lived here forty plus years; they're still outsiders. Oh yeah, but. Still, we love to be here yeah, and it's, uh, it's love be to be tolerated by you locals. It's a beautiful place. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic yeah. place to live. All right. Do we want to talk about the third issue or do we want to move on? What is the third issue well, the third on the ballot? The third issue on the ballot that we're going to be voting for or on is the real sleeper. Okay. This, this issue is potentially uh, the dynamite in the basement. Okay. This is for job creation job expansion and economic development. And what this legislation, if it is passed, is going to do is it's going to remove the limitation on the amount that the state and local governments can obligate the voters or the citizens to under bond issues. Now currently the, the, the provisions under the state constitution limit the state to issuing bonds in no more than 5% of the value of last year's physical revenue. Okay, so when you look at what we made last year, that means that the state of Arkansas can only obligate itself for future indebtedness in the amount of about $300 million a year. When it comes to long-term creation of infrastructure, the building of roads, highways, bridges, all of those things, $300 million is just a drop in the bucket. And so under the new proposal, if this legislation passes, then the, the state is going to be authorized to exceed that amount. And I'm, I'm not really clear on how much they can exceed it by, but... Are they going to take all limits off you of, know, of the bond? Uh, I think that there may be uh, the provision, I think as it is presented, would allow the legislature to make that decision. Oh, perfect. Well, well, so we mm -hmm. at our age, mm -hmm. let's borrow all the money we can. Well, our we'll, kids are going to have to pay it. Uh, well, I don't know if anybody will pay it. Uh, and and you make a really good point here because the downside of this is that we have some seen some states in Puerto Rico as an example exactly. who have essentially borrowed to the point that they have gone bankrupt. And we have seen some local municipalities do that as well. Detroit is another example. And, and uh, our country as a whole, is, uh, mm -hmm. our indebtedness is mm -hmm. a major, major issue yeah. in, in our governing ourselves. But on, on, the, on, the, on the other side of that coin, you can't do very much to improve things 
if you have so little money that you can you can borrow you know it's like having a five hundred dollar credit uh, limit on your credit card you, you're not going to get in very much trouble but you're not going to be able to do much either indeed okay. uh, it, it I'd be interested to, if our listeners have any opinions on any of these issues uh, give us a shout let us know when we, we'll uh, we'll let the world know how you feel about this well, let, me, let me let me say one more thing about about that particular issue down at the local level the city of Eureka Springs here in Carroll County is struggling with rebuilding the infrastructure especially the water system and sewage systems within the city uh, they're trying to raise a, I can't remember if it's a 1% or a half percent tax, you know, to pay for building this infrastructure. There's a lot of concern and controversy about who is actually going to be footing the bill for that. And under the, the current proposal, uh, we're looking at imposing a tax which will be collected on everyone, tourists and citizens alike. And there's arguments that it should all the burden should be placed on property owners and they should have to pay for it. Regardless of, of whether or not this passes, this measure would actually give the city at least the potential ability to pass a bond issue, sell bonds, which is long-term indebtedness, to make those improvements and pay it off perhaps with a smaller tax rather than a 1% uh, or look at some other options and, and find other ways uh, to finance the, uh, the the infrastructure improvements they need to make. Well, I know that uh, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, and I, I've played devil's advocate and professed that uh, the property owners need to pony up on these things. I hope that we can come out with a financial solution that is more fair and balanced. And I, I, we can't put all the burden on the property owners. What they're probably what is the percentage of property owners in that community you know, and there's a huge tourist uh, influx and in, uh, it's something that need due diligence needs to be done and I hope it it is being done well Eureka Springs is in the same position as a lot of small towns only for Eureka Springs we're talking about a city or a town of just under 2,000 people now their population has dropped but typically they still see in the neighborhood of 750 to a little over a million tourists a year uh, come to their city. Uh, so when you look at... And the, that's a great drain on the infrastructure. It, it's uh, a huge burden on the infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, next week we'll go through the last four issues on the November ballot for Arkansas before we move on to the new uh, I, I think it, it's great. I've learned something today about some of these issues. And, and folks, educate yourselves about what you are voting for and please go out and vote. This election season, uh, a lot of folks I know said, I, it's just not worth it. I'm not going to go vote. This is the time where we have to go vote. And if you want to know more about these issues, the University of Arkansas online has a voter's guide. Type in uh, Arkansas ballot issues and it will take you to their website or at least give you a link to it. Uh, you can read the actual legislation and you can read the pros and cons uh, of each issue and who is supporting it and who is opposing it. All right. Well, uh, I think okay. we can move on. Ken? All right. Sharon Laborde is still around, isn't she, Richard? Yes, she is. You know, uh, she, as always, uh, Welcome to the Conversation is, is coming up now, I think. Well, good. Let's go listen to Sharon. Welcome to the Conversation. This is Sharon Laborde. In an attempt to remain positive during trying times and avoid adding more negative comments to the world we live in, I continue this week with a look at another writer who has contributed to the culture of the Ozarks and given us a large body of work that is first rate. Ellen Gilchrist is an award-winning writer known for her poetry, novels, and story collections. She was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and studied under the great Southern author Eudora Welty at Millsaps College before coming an acclaimed writer, winning the 1984 National Book Award for her second book of stories, Victory Over Japan. And there would be many more works to follow over the years, including a memoir, novels, and other story collections. 
As a young person, she moved often with her family due to her father's army career. She had an active imagination and a passion for reading growing up, going on to pen her own column in a Kentucky newspaper as a teenager. She later attended both Vanderbilt University and Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. Her first book, The Land Surveyor's Daughter, published in 1979, is a work of poetry, and in 1981 she followed it up with her fiction debut, a book of short stories titled In the Land of Dreamy Dreams, which generated critical buzz and was published by the University of Arkansas Press. After her first novel, The Annunciation, released in 1983, she followed up with the award-winning assortment of stories, Victory Over Japan. Gilchrist has released a large number of titles over the decades. Additional short story collections include Light Can Be Both Wave and Particle, 1989, and The Courts of Love, 1996, accompanied by novels like The Net of Jewels, 1992, Sarah Connolly, 1997, and A Dangerous Age, 2008, and nonfiction, 1987's Falling Through Space, The Journals of Ellen Gilchrist, which collected her year-long commentary from NPR's Morning Edition. And in 2005, she released the memoir, The Writing Life. The distinctive, witty style of Gilchrist's tales have focused on women of the South, with some figures returning again and again, as in Life and Stories collections of Rhoda, 1995, and Nora Jane, 2005. Her focus is really not surprising since she is a Southern writer, born in Mississippi into that strong storytelling tradition, but she has developed deep roots here in the Ozarks. In fact, I think one of my favorite books about the Ozarks is her first novel, The Annunciation. The site Southern Scribe says, The novel foreshadows the themes she returns to repeatedly through her works growing up, leaving home, falling in and out of love, and trying again. The main character, Amanda McCamey, comes alive in the book as she tells her story. Pregnant at 14, she's sent away by her grandmother to a New Orleans home for unwed mothers, while the father of her child, her cousin, by the way, goes merrily on to play football at Ole Miss. But after this rough beginning, she marries into a wealthy society family, only to find her life empty and unfulfilled. At midlife, she divorces her husband and moves to Arkansas and does translations at the university. Her life in Fayetteville opens up a new world. Well, I won't give away the plot. Let's just say that the novel falls into a broad genre, almost Southern Gothic, but with an intellectual appeal. Yes, there's a dark side to the story, and the ending is shocking, at least it was to me. But it's the description of the landscapes of the Ozark Mountains that really draws me in. Roughing it in the wilderness, camping and canoeing give the novel an authenticity not found in every work I've picked up about our part of the world. In the following excerpt from the Annunciation, the main character experiences her first canoe trip down the Buffalo River in northwest Arkansas. Amanda paddled. She sat up straight pulling her torso up out of her rib cage, leaning over the side, paddling as hard as she could. Will tossed away his cigarette and guided them around the tree and down a little three-tiered waterfall, and they were off down the winding, spinning first half mile of the high buffalo. Paddle, he yelled. You're doing great. Amanda paddled harder. After a while, the water smoothed out and they coasted past a rock-covered beach and on down to where the river became a pool with huge black and gray cliffs rising up like eagles' wings. 
Look at the bluffs, Will said. Is that as good as Steuben glass? It smells so good, he said. I'd forgotten the smell. And she's running, she's running like a dream. The canyon narrowed. The water became swifter again. Listen, Will said. In the distance, Amanda could hear the rapids. She leaned into the paddle. In a moment, they were upon a rush of water falling over stone ledges. She felt the adrenaline pour down into her arms and fingertips. They were through a couple of long, exciting shoots. Then the river ran down to a shelf of level land. Around them and behind them were dense, unbroken woods. A jungle of trees met over their head like a green tunnel. It was quieter here, darker, and Amanda sat back, letting Will do the work for a while. What is it about Southern riders? It seems to be bred in the bone, that ability to set a scene in a landscape so vivid that it's haunting. From the starkness of the Mississippi Delta, the harshness and lushness of South Louisiana, to the Ozark Mountains, the landscape of the South many times becomes what the reader remembers most long after the details about the characters have faded away. I didn't know Ellen Gilchrist had studied under Eudora Welty in Mississippi until I did a little research on her background and have to admit to being a bit jealous, but now that I know, I can see the influence. And speaking of Miss Eudora Welty, I can't resist telling you about seeing her at the University of Alabama in a packed auditorium many years ago. She came to speak and to read some of her work. I even remember the dress she wore. It was a pale mauve, mid-calf length, expensive looking but simple. She wore a purple orchid on her left shoulder and looked every inch a lady as she read her short story, Why I Live at the P.O., to a rapt audience. At the time, I was just beginning to understand that there were some special people whose life was defined by the creative energy that possessed them. She had that magic about her and seemed to be comfortable with it self-contained in her solitude. She was magnificent. I highly recommend both of these authors as an antidote to the modern world. There's nothing wrong with escaping with a good book. As Ellen Gilchrist once said, great and startling books have taught and changed me, have made me wish for nobility and dream of changing the world. They have solaced me when I was young and in love, made me laugh at myself for needing solace, and helped me grow old without noticing I had. Thank you for joining me on Welcome to the Conversation. I'll be back soon with more reflections and interviews on life and the creative spirit in the beautiful Ozark Mountains. Until then, this is Sharon Laborde, cultural editor of ORO, Voice of the Ozarks. As always, thank you, Sharon. Next is Tracy Johnson, and music is medicine for the soul. Thanks again for joining me on Music is Medicine for the Soul. This is Tracy. Today I'm actually in my car right now driving to downtown Eureka Springs where I'm going to be at Chelsea's at 10 Mountain Street. They have Saturday afternoon music on the patio. It starts at 2 and they play until about 5. It's an acoustic set and it varies from week to week. It is an all ages show and they have pizza upstairs so I'm looking forward to a good afternoon with lots of locals. We're going to catch up with some locals and find out how important music is to them. A lot of these people have been living here for 40, 50 years and uh, the heartbeat of this town is music. And it looks like they're still playing up there. We have Chris Bradley playing fiddle. Chris Bradley has been living in Eureka Springs forever. There's Gates Magoo. We first learned about him when I did a segment on street buskers. And then Daniel Redman is on stand-up bass. Daniel, uh, previously of Mountain Sprout, he's now in a solo project called The One-Eyed Plumber. 
So we're gonna go on inside and see what everybody's up to. We made it just in time for one song by the music on the patio and what you heard in there was a tenor banjo. Daniel Redmond had sat down his stand-up bass to switch out instruments and we're gonna head inside now to see what everybody thinks about this wonderful Saturday afternoon. Well I've walked inside from the music and guess who I found? Guilty as charged hanging out at Chelsea's during the daytime. Yes, it's Richard Pillay, our own Richard Pillay. Yes but it is not really daytime it's the weekend. Well, they know this is pre-recorded. It is the weekend. Uh, oh, at any rate, it's still the weekend, pre-recorded or not. Yeah. It is actually Saturday. <laughs> and a great Saturday it is. Why did you come to Chelsea's this afternoon? I came to hear the Skinny Gypsies play in the afternoon. You know, I'm a very old man. And usually the music in this town is late, late, late. And sometimes it happens after 7 o'clock in the evening. I cannot believe that. Who you would ever oh, I, do something And be up that late. But anyway, they're played this afternoon on the patio out here and I got to hear live music. I mean, doesn't get much better than that, does it? It doesn't. And Chelsea's is actually having music on the patio every Saturday this fall. And guess who's coming back next Saturday, Who? the 24th? Rosenbridge, one of our favorites. Oh, absolutely. They're going to start at 2 o'clock. So come on down, see All us at Chelsea's. Right. We're going to go catch up with someone else and find out why music is so important to Eureka Springs. We've come inside of the bar where Nate Huff is bartending. Anybody that's been in Chelsea's has met Nate. He's been here forever. And a rare treat today, we have cocktail waitressing Gina Rose Galina. Hi! Gina's in an incredible band called the Camptown Ladies. She's been promising us a segment for about nine months now. Maybe eventually she'll make some time for us because she's incredible. Oh no, I'm talking about an interview. You're going to give us an interview soon, don't <laughs> Camptown Ladies Art, you all have a show here on what date? October 14th at the Stone House. Oh, at the Stone House on October 14th. 6 to 9. 6 to 9, the Camptown Ladies are playing. Mike Hopper. Mike Hopper, who's incredible. He was out on tour with Nathan Kalish. You've heard a little bit of him before. So look what happens at Chelsea's on Saturday. You have all these incredible people in one spot and music from 2 to 5 for the rest of fall. I know I use the word incredible an awful lot this time, but... Sometimes there are no other words to describe the music that happens in this town. And speaking of incredible, we're going to leave you all today with another song from Rosenbridge. Get you all ready for next week's music on the patio. Until then, happy trails, safe travels. Please don't forget, music is medicine for the soul. So come on out and see us.
Well, thanks, Tracy, once again, you know, that girl is so much fun. She gets to do things that... Uh, that old people can't stay up late enough to do. Dang it, there you go again, you know? <laughs> You know, no, through, through the great. magic through the magic of radio, no one knows what we'd look like, Richard. Yeah, if, if it weren't for Jeremiah, nobody would even know we were old guys. Oh, I try and remind people how old you are all the time. You do. I do. You know, that's one of the nice things about you. You're always <laughs> willing to smear a friend. Well, anyway, uh, Jeremiah, before we go, how's Dan Croats doing? Well, Dan is doing just fine. He's recovering from post-traumatic stress disorder and... You guys weren't the one that put him through the traumatic no, wait, experience. <laughs> okay. What would make you think so lowly of Kent and I? Well, you guys won't be planning on putting me through any kind of traumatic experience, correct? No. You're not, you're not <laughs> getting around long enough for us to do that to you. You know, you're here to dismantle this whole program and, and put us on, on the slippery slope of margarine radio. <laughs> or is that marginal That's radio? Oleo, and it's spelled differently, and I really oh. like it. You do? I do. You just like to say it. Oleo radio. Oleo radio. Oleo radio. Oleo radio. Oh, yeah, well, well, we'll see how you do with writing your own scripts. Yeah. Well, okay. Ken, you know, Dan has developed cla claustrophobia from the course of being with you two. Well, you know, we, you know, keeping Dan inside the box has not been an easy job. Well, he, he's always had claustrophobia, Jeremiah. Yeah. When we were first putting him in the producer's box, he screamed to not be locked in there. We were just making sure he did his work, that's all. Mm. Well, I guess that makes me feel better, I suppose. And are you two ready to leave? I think we are. Do you think we are? Well... Have you said all you want to say? You Do you have any, I just was, you know... Do you have any other thoughts you want to share with our audience today? And folk, I, the main thought I want is really important that you become a citizen of this world. You've got to vote. You've got to pay attention to what's going on, what's happening in in this chaotic circumstance we have going on in our national and local politics is our fault. We're getting exactly what we deserve because we have not been involved. We do not vote. We just throw our hands in the air and we've given up our country to other people, to radicals. Everybody needs to have their voice. You know what I hear you saying, election. Richard, is that because of some political developments over the last few years, including Supreme Court decisions which have allowed uh, unbridled funding of uh, elections and, and contributions through corporations, that uh, we're seeing kind of a, a war between uh, two edges of the fringe. We've, we've got fringe elements in this country, a small percentage of the people who are selecting our candidates, and then they're funded by large corporations. Well, you know, in the 60s, we were going to change the world, make it all better. I did. And, and well, you helped a lot, and <laughs> thank you for your service. But what we really did was uh, we moved the ability of people be, to make behind-the-door deals in Congress and legislature. We went to a direct populist vote for a primary election, and it, when only 12% of the people vote, who votes? Mm -hmm. People with a passion, people that are, are extreme in their beliefs make up that 12%. Well, Whether and then there's the old people right, like us. The old people like us vote. And without the entire population being involved, uh, read the Constitution. It's supposed to be a government of and by the people. Well, it isn't anymore. And we, maybe, a little bit from this Oleo radio, can get people excited to be citizens of this country. And uh, and I, I'm very hopeful. If, if everybody got involved, I, the, the American people are really put pretty cool people. They're just not involved in this process. Kind of kind of reminds me of a jury, you know. Twelve heads are better than one. Well, it's true. Yeah. But that's really, I'm going to be talking about that on Oleo Radio a little bit more. And I see a, a great trend in urban environments where there's been huge economic catastrophes where small gardening and farming, which is you all know is, is one of my passions, has really turned the economic structure of ghettos and other places completely around. There's uh, uh, 
cleaner places, less violence. We've got ex gangbangers that come out of prison with with degrees and uh, are changing their neighborhood. They're giving the young people something to do that's positive and. F- I'm I'm very so encouraged. As we, bad as things seem, I'm very encouraged about what's so, going so on. So from the standpoint of what you're going to be doing on Oleo Radio is bringing a message of hope and a brightness to the to the future that uh, you know some people like myself may not uh, be capable of seeing. And so you're going to get on a soapbox yeah, and pontificate. I, I hope it's not a soapbox. I I'm just going to, for instance. I'm going to be talking next week about a, a wonderful situation right here in Bearville, mm-hmm. where some folks got together and uh, they're supporting all Special Olympics mm-hmm. individuals. They're, uh, they can't fundraise for Special Olympics, but they're selling some of the best pulled pork in the world oh. at the football games, okay. uh, and they're supporting physically challenged athletes here in in our own community. Things like that are happening all over the place. <laughs> Hey, it's great stuff. Did you notice when you came in today that that Berryville has started a sidewalk renovation and they are actually ripping up sidewalks around the Berryville Square? I, so that got passed and it's well, in, well, in well, it's functioning. It's part of the you know we on the Berryville Restoration Committee are really excited about that. We've been trying to work with the the mayor and the city uh, to get the sidewalk on the Berryville Square renovated for some time. The mayor said he was going to do it, and today I got to town. And by golly, they were ripping up sidewalks. Well, you know, positive things happening are, mm-hmm. is what I'd like to focus on. Mm-hmm. We can listen to any radio station and hear what's wrong with us all. I'd like to kind of focus on what's right with us You're going to get a chance. And hey, you know what? I think we are done now. All right, then. As always, until next week, adios. <laughs>